Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Measuring Visual Acuity and Contrast Sensitivity by Optimotor Reflex in Rodents. This is Haley Culleton from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by Strytech and supported in part by Stolting and will feature scientists sharing case studies and bias-free experimental data from various applications using a newly developed automated system to measure vision based on the Optimotor Reflex. First, you will hear from Dr. Subramanian from the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. He will explain how chromatin architecture affects light scattering by photoreceptor nuclei. Following, he will show how the chromatin architecture found in night active animals provides a vision, visual advantage under scotopic conditions. Following, Professor Volker Ensman from the University Hospital in Bern will discuss the pros and cons of using OMR measurements as a readout tool for visual performance in mouse models of retinal degeneration. In addition, he will share data from his research on multiple sclerosis laser treatments and treatment with sodium iodate. Now, without further ado, I will welcome Dr. Thomas Minch, Director of Research and Development for Strytech, to deliver a brief introduction of OMR and the Optidrum. Thank you, Haley, and also a warm welcome from myself. My name is Thomas Münch, and I am one of the founders of Striatech, together with Boris Benkner and Marian Mutter. We are all experienced neuroscientists in the field of vision research. At Striatech, we develop testing tools for vision research. In case there are any questions left after this webinar that may not have been answered in the Q&A session, you're more than welcome to contact us directly. Today, we will focus on how one can determine how well an animal can see. This is a non-trivial problem, of course. There are many research applications where this is an important question, in particular when one does preclinical research on visual diseases. One widely used approach is measuring the optomotor reflex, or OMR, as an indicator of visual ability. You can see the optomotor reflex in action in this video where we have recorded a mouse from above. The mouse follows this rotating stripe pattern with its gaze. To bring everyone on the same page, I will shortly explain what the optomotor reflex is. When there is a global movement of the environment, the optomotor reflex causes an involuntary head movement. The animal follows the moving environment with its gaze. The purpose of the optomotor reflex is to visually stabilize the environment. Of course, the optomotor reflex is only triggered when the mouse can actually see that stripe pattern. This is why we can take advantage of the optomotor reflex to find out how well the animal can see, to quantify its visual abilities. We can observe the mouse and we can check if the optomotor reflex is triggered while making the stimulus more and more difficult until the optomotor reflex is not triggered anymore. For example, we can, make the, the, we can make these stripes finer and finer as seen here on the right until the optomotor reflex stops. That's when we have reached the animal's visual acuity threshold. Similarly, we can keep the stripe width constant and make the contrast of the stripe pattern weaker and weaker. Eventually, the contrast is too weak, the animal does not show the optomotor reflex, and we have found the animal's contrast threshold. So, using the optomotor reflex to find the animal's visual threshold can be very convenient. Because it is a reflex, there is no training required. Any naive animal can be tested right away. Second, the animal does not need to be restrained. It does not require surgery. Third, this reflex exists at the time of eye opening. It is therefore possible to characterize and follow the animal's vision, even for early onset retinal diseases. Fourth, it is possible to measure an animal repeatedly and track disease progression. Fifth, the optomotor reflex is robust, which allows to recognize even small improvements of vision. And finally, one can easily explore both visual acuity and contrast sensitivity, as I have mentioned before. Two words of caution, though. Because it is a reflex, uh, it does not measure con uh, conscious vision. It is a subcortical reflex. And second, because it is so robust, moderate decline of vision 
might not be reflected in a decline of the optomotor performance. This depends very much on the disease model. We will have one case study later where we can see that local injuries of the retina do not alter the optomotor reflex. What is the main challenge in such vision research? Research on eye diseases and vision disorders is usually carried out with rodents, especially mice and rats. For that, it is essential that the researcher can identify how well that animal can see. We have already seen that the optomotor reflex can give you an answer to that question. However, if you were to analyze the animal behavior manually, there would be several problems. There is bias of the researcher. Different observers actually do get different results. In other words, one will get rather non-consistent data. And furthermore, this is very time consuming. And all of these points could be overcome with a reliable automated analysis. That is why we at Stridetech have developed the Optodrum. We wanted a reliable and objective device for measuring the vision of rodents automatically. How does the Optodrum work? Here is the general overview. The animal is placed on an elevated platform in the middle of the arena where it is surrounded by computer monitors. On the monitors, we show uh, we show a rotating stripe pattern, which can trigger the optomotor reflex. With the camera, we observe the animal from above and the Optodrum software detects the animal and analyzes its behavior. Then the stimulus pattern is continuously and automatically adjusted throughout with the goal to find the visual threshold of the animal. I would like to introduce how such optomotor data looks like. The example I will use is data from a mouse line with retinal degeneration, the so-called RD10 mouse line. In these mice, photoreceptors die due to a mutated rod-specific gene. Over time, these mice become blind. RD10 mice are a widely used model for the disease retinitis pigmentosa. How does the data look like when one measures contrast sensitivity? First, some definitions. The so-called contrast threshold is the weakest contrast that still triggers the optomotor reflex, as illustrated in the photos on the right. Contrast sensitivity is then defined as the inverse of the contrast threshold. Larger values of contrast sensitivity mean that the mouse can see better. This graph shows the contrast sensitivity of wild type mice in black and of RD10 mice at two different ages, one month old in red and three month old in blue. It is clear that the contrast sensitivity of RD10 animals is impaired compared to wild type animals and that their vision becomes worse over time. It is important to note that contrast sensitivity depends on the resolution at which one measures the optomotor reflex. Here are the results for contrast sensitivity for two additional resolutions. You can see that 0.15 cycles per degree is a better resolution, while even finer stripes with a resolution of 0.3 cycles per degree don't trigger the optomotor reflex as strongly. In fact, old RD10 animals don't show the optomotor reflex at all at this high resolution. This line graph shows the same data again, the contrast sensitivity of wild type mice in black and young and old RD10 animals in red and blue respectively, measured at these three different resolutions. Next, let's have a look at measuring visual acuity. The visual acuity threshold is defined as the highest resolution that still triggers the optomotor reflex. Usually this is measured at maximal contrast. This graph shows the visual acuity threshold for wild type animals and young and old RD10 animals. Again, you can appreciate that the vision of RD10 animals is impaired. This is how you uh, often find the results for visual acuity represented in the literature. And we will also see examples 
later in this webinar. Let's turn this graph 90 degrees to its side, however. This way, we can incorporate the visual acuity results into the previous graph that shows the animal's contrast sensitivity. Since the, activity, uh, since the acuity was measured at the maximal contrast, this data would fall onto the bottom of the contrast sensitivity axis, like this. Together, this data shows a rather complete so-called contrast sensitivity function of wild type and RD10 mice. And it shows how the visual impairment of RD10 mice becomes worse with age. For most research projects, it will not be necessary to determine the full contrast sensitivity function of your animals. It is often sufficient to measure only visual acuity or only contrast sensitivity at a certain resolution. In this webinar today, we will look at several application areas of optomotor measurements. Most people associate optomotor measurements with studying retinal degeneration, and it is indeed a great tool for that. I've already shown you the example of RD10 mice and how their visual impairment can be characterized and followed over time. Kaushikaram Supramanian will show us an example that optomotor reflex measurements can also answer very basic biological questions about vision in this case about the benefits of the very specific nuclear architecture in rods. Further, one can study the, pharmacolog the pharmacology and toxicology of substances. Volker Etzmann will talk about the toxic effects of a small molecule, sodium iodide, that when applied mimics the disease of age-related macular degeneration. In the final example, Volker will introduce us to a mouse model that is commonly used to study multiple sclerosis, which does indeed also have visual deficits. These are caused by damages to the optic nerve, and disease progression can be monitored with the optomotor reflex. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation, Thomas. And now, on to Dr. Subramanian. Thank you, Haley. Today, I will be talking about the relevance of the rod nuclear architecture for animals' vision and behavior. This was my PhD project in the lab of Dr. Moritz Kreising at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics. In this study that I will talk to you about today, we have shown that changes in the cell architecture of the retina can have a large impact on the optical properties of the retinal tissue and also significantly improve visual abilities. To start with, let's look at the cellular architecture. The normal arrangement of chromatin or DNA material in the cell nucleus is such that the euchromatin or the transcriptionally active chromatin is in the center of the nucleus shown here in green and heterochromatin which is transcriptionally inactive or silence chromatin is located along the nuclear membrane or the periphery shown here in red. This normal arrangement is also found in the rod photoreceptors of diurnal animals or animals that are active during the day. Interestingly, the rods of the nocturnal animals, however, show an inverted architecture. Here, the heterochromatin is located in the center of the nucleus, which is compacted and the euchromatin is pushed to the periphery. This raises biologically many interesting questions. And also, since this is happening in the retina, the main question was, does this have any optical effects? And the cellular architecture arises uh, from the birth of the animal during its terminal development as the retina matures towards its adult state. And in the first month of development during the due to the absence of two lamina proteins, 
namely lamin AC and lamin B receptor, the heterochromatin is freed and detethers itself from the periphery to get compacted to the central region. And when the lamin B receptor protein is overexpressed, we can developmentally arrest the progression of this inversion to have animals that have a diurnal type retina or retinal with rod photoreceptors having a conventional nuclear architecture. And using such LBR mouse models, we were able to investigate the optical consequences of the two different nuclear architectures. So how do the different nuclear architectures influence the optical properties of the retina? To answer this question, we first need to look at why at all we need to study the optics of the retina. And especially in case of the vertebrate retina and the vertebrate eye, which is a camera type eye with the lens projecting the objects of, of, on, from the visual field onto the retina, which acts as an image screen. The stratification of the cell layers is itself intriguingly different such that the light actually has to pass through hundreds of microns of neuronal tissue before being detected by the photoreceptors, as you see on to the right. And the nucleus of the photoreceptors themselves act as a significant barrier. As you can see here, there are multiple layers of the rod nuclei sitting in front of the photoreceptor outer segments. And from our, uh, and it was suggested that the chromatin inversion uh, enables each individual nuclei to act as a little lens that helps focus the image onto the photoreceptor outer segments. And as a result, the image would be less scattered and the contrast of the transmitted image would be improved. To test this hypothesis, we measured how cleanly an image is transmitted through the retina by recording the transmitted image with a camera and analyzing it. To the left, you see the schematic of the microscope, custom microscope that we built, which, with which we can project images onto the retina and record those images to later see how image transmission through the retina takes place. Cutting short the details of the measurements, the end result was that the when the retina develops from normal nuclear architecture or the conventional architecture to the inverted architecture, retinal contrast transmission improves for basically all spatial frequencies. So all sizes of stripes that you see in the x-axis and the contrast is shown in the y-axis. So that is consistently better performance of the wild type retina shown in the gray bars compared to the contrast transmission of a developing pup, which is two weeks old shown in, in the blue bars. Also, this correlation can be causally explained and established by using the mouse model in which the LBR or lamin B receptor is overexpressed such that upon arresting the development of the nuclear architecture, we can also arrest the optical development of the retina. Or in other words, the nuclear inversion actually imparts this increased or enhanced optical quality to the retina. So next we asked what are the visual consequences for the animal of this improvement in optical properties of the retina. For this, we measured the contrast sensitivity of normal adult mice and LBR adult mice with the help of the optomotor reflex using Striatex optodrum.
We determine the contrast sensitivity of the mice at 12 different spatial frequencies or resolutions to obtain a contrast sensitivity function as shown here. To quantify the contrast sensitivity and compare different animals, we calculated the area under the curve and higher values here mean that there is better contrast sensitivity or better integrated sensitivity. In the photopic conditions, there was no difference between the wild type mouse and the inverted with the new inverted nuclear architecture that is shown in gray and uh, in red we see it for the LBR mice. This shows that under daylight conditions there is no advantage of the nuclear inversion. This may explain why diurnal animals do not have or have no need to invert their nuclei. However, when we measured the contrast sensitivity of the animals under scotopic conditions by putting appropriate dimming filters in front of the monitor of the optodrum, under these scotopic conditions, contrast sensitivity measured behaviorally was significantly better in the wild type mice that have the nuclear inversion. In other words, during nighttime conditions, nuclear inversion grants an exclusive and significant advantage. We made measurements under 20 millilux, which is around moonlight conditions, and at around 2 millilux, which mimics starlight conditions. What, what does this uh, tell about a mouse's behavior in the wild? As a simple example, if a mouse is approached by a cat at the night, the low contrast image of the predator on the mouse's retina would be perceived earlier and better by the wild type mouse, as you see on the uh, left with a gray bar, compared to the LBR mouse without the nuclear inversion. So at far off distances, the wild type mouse is just able to perceive while the LBR mouse fails to see the approach. And a point to be noted is that these exciting results were only possible by measuring the optomotor reflex under scotopic or, or low light conditions. With this, I would like to acknowledge my host lab, Dr. Moritz Kreising, for allowing me to carry out the research in his lab the facilities of the Max Planck Society and the Max Planck Institute, all our collaborators, especially Oliver Bosch from the Ada Lab of the CRTD, who helped me in the optomotor experiments, and also Stratech for providing the setup and the infrastructure allowing me to do so. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to welcome Dr. Volker Ensman to the line. Thank you so much for being with us today. And the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Uh, welcome from my side as well. My name is Volker Ensman. I'm the research director of the Department of Ophthalmology here at the University of Bern. And my group is working with the retina degeneration and regeneration. Retina degeneration is one of the most prevalent eye diseases in the industrial world. Therefore, the development of new approaches for treatment is eminent. In this regard, the employment of animal models that mimic the degenerative changes and show the effectiveness of the experimental alterations is pivotal. So animal models of retina degeneration Degeneration come in different flavors. You have, for instance, the genetic models, the knockout models, the pharmacological models, and the laser-induced models. Especially, I would like to talk today about some pharmacological models, like the sodium iodate model in different animal species, and uh, also the, the model uh, of experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, which has the origin in the brain, 
but where you can also measure effects in the retina. Furthermore, I would like to talk about a laser-induced model, the diode laser-induced damage in, in the outer retina, which can also be used uh, in uh, different uh, animal spe species like zebra fish and mouse. Um, there is always measurement of function, uh, a very important point to validate the animal models and especially to quantify changes after the treatment if you are looking to develop new uh, therapeutic approaches. So today I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, first, I would like to focus on uh, the sodium iodate model of uh, retina degeneration. Then second, about the diode laser induced damage in the outer uh, nuclear layer. And finally, I will give you some information about a brain model that can also lead to changes in the retina. Let's start first with uh, the sodium iodate model, which is actually a quite old pharmacological model. It's already known since the 30s, um, and it is uh, characterized by selective toxicity for the retinal pigment epithelium, uh, where it, uh, its use induces a necrosis, which then is followed by photoreceptor death uh, which is uh, in, induced by apoptosis. As the sodium iodate model uh, mimics only symptoms of dry AMD, but you have to be careful, you cannot name it an AMD model because uh, mice have no macula. The model itself is characterized by concentration dependent and time dependent changes, especially in the morphology of the retina. As you can see here to the left, uh, there is um, a diminished RPE out of fluorescence, which can, you can appreciate if you look at the, at the patchy loss in the larger image and comparing it to the equally distributed melanin out of fluorescence in the insert. Uh, that degenerated RPE layer is also seen in uh, the agent E overview um, image in the center where you can uh, see a destroyed RPE monolayer uh, and uh, also uh, a diminished retina thickness in the OCT in the optical coherence tomography images to the right. So all together these uh, morphological changes in the outer retina lead also to functional deficits, and these functional deficits could be measured in an electroretinogram, but also in the opto by also using uh, the optomotor reflex. And that is what we have done. Uh, to uh, characterize our model, we have used the optodrum from Striatec uh, in order to, to follow up the visual, the development of the visual function. And then we have compared that over time with the uh, images uh, we, we get from optical coherence tomography. This is shown here. When you look at the left, uh, you have um, a, a graph of the development of the uh, visual acuity in untreated mice to the left, where you can see that over time there is no significant change in visual acuity. But when you treat the animals with sodium iodate in different concentrations, you can see over time and uh, regarding the concentration a significant decrease in visual acuity uh, with 35 milligram. You see a significant decrease, for instance, after 10 days. With 50 milligram sodium iodate, you see the significant um, damage or the, the, the significant decrease of uh, visual acuity already after three days. And it is uh, stronger than uh, the diminished uh, visual acuity with 35 milligram. And when you compare that to the right, when you look at the uh, thickness of the retinal thickness uh, in the optical coherence tomography, you see over time 
a, a thinning of uh, the, the retina. So that gives us uh, gives you an idea about the correlation between morphological changes and functional changes. But when we look at a different animal model, in this case, it is the diode laser induced damage to the photoreceptors. Uh, it looks a little bit, little bit different. Here we are using a, a model of photoreceptor degeneration induced with a diode laser of uh, 532 nanometer wavelengths. And what we do, we, we induce uh, four laser, uh, six, uh, four to six laser spots to the retina with a diameter of approximately 100 micrometer. And you can easily see when you look in the uh, OCT image uh, right on top. There is a focal damage to the outer nuclear layer, which could be also uh, seen when, uh, when you stain this H and E. That uh, focal damage induces uh, a, a Müller cell activation that you can see to the right with uh, GFE, GFAP positively stained Müller cells. And in the end, it gives you a scar formation uh, at the area of the laser damage. In the mouse, we don't have any regeneration. However, if you use the same model in the zebrafish, you see after 14 days a complete regeneration of the damaged retina. So now we would like to know if there is a correlation between the morphological changes you just saw and the function of the retina. So to in investigate that, we were looking uh, over a, a time of approximately 28 days for the functional measurement uh, with the determination of the visual acuity and compare that to the um, images of the OCT. And what you can see here that even after 28 days, there is no significant change of the visual acuity in the laser treated animals. But in the OCT images, you can clearly see at every investigated time point uh, a glial scar, which is still visible at day 28. So hereby, you see that there is no correlation between the, the morphological change and the visual uh, function. That brings me to the conclusions of the first part of my talk. Um, as I showed you, functional measurements, they depend always on the damage extent. The detection of functional deficits in models with focal damage are especially uh, difficult, as you have just seen in the laser-induced model of retinal degeneration. The conclusion of that is that you basically always have to evaluate the method of visual measure uh, the, the, the method of measuring the visual acuity in your special model and of course there are alternatives to the uh, optomotor reflex measurement uh, let's just mention the cute water maze which is on the other hand however uh, not that sensitive compared to the uh, optomotor reflex measurement but then you have also the electroretinogram where you can measure specific specifically the the changes in the the a and the b wave and correlate that to the damage in the inner or in the outer uh, retina and you can all also use the focal erg that gives you the possibility to measure directly uh, the function directly on the, the focal uh, damage point. Uh, in the last part of my uh, talk, uh, I would like to give you some information about uh, a model of uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, which uh, we are going to use also for um, optic neuropathy because for the disease optic neuropathy there is no animal model available. 
Uh, optic neuropathy is also called optic neuritis and it is characterized by inflammation of the optic nerve. As you can see in the, in the bottom images uh, to the left, you see a schemata of an inflamed optic nerve. In the center, you see the swelling, the disc swelling in the area of the optic uh, nerve head, which gives you also a hint uh, of uh, optic nerve inflammation. The, the main uh, symptoms are temporary vision loss and pain. Fortunately, uh, the most patients suffer only an episode of this con condition with uh, fully recovers uh, over time. Risk factors are adults aged 20 to 45 and uh, women are twice likely as men to suffer from optic neuropathy. So our question is now, could we use that experimental model of autoimmune encephalomyelitis as a, as a model for optic neuropathy? So EAE, the most common uh, experimental model for MS is induced by the immunization with myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, which is emulsified with complete Freund's adherence. We are using an augmented version of the model where we additionally inject an anti mock antibody. The um, time the disease course is as follows. You, we give an injection of uh, a subcutaneous injection of the mock peptide and the injection of the pertussis toxin, which is going to be repeated on day two. Uh, and followed in our case in the augmented model version uh, on day 10 with an IV injection of an anti of an anti mock antibodies. Then uh, at day 14 and day 28, after um, starting the experiments, we are going to measure the optokinetic reflex for visual function, and we are also uh, measuring the optic uh, the OCT the thickness of the retina uh, of the retina. So when we do the functional measurements in EAE, uh, we, we can uh, clearly see that the visual acuity correlates with the disease severity. So when you look at the, at the left graph, you can see that the, the uh, development of the disease uh, uh, course is uh, stronger in our augmented model compared to the basic EAE uh, model. And this is directly correlated with the visual acuity, as you can see on the, at the right graph, where the, the control animals have a, a, a a visual acuity uh, of approximately 0.5, which is severity grade of zero. The non-augmented EAE animals have um, an, a disease score of approximately two to three and have a lower visual acuity. And in the augmented group, you have not only uh, a, a much higher severity score of the disease, we are talking about six to seven, but you have even a further diminished visual acuity that clearly is correlated to the uh, disease uh, severity. So when you have animals, more animal models for certain, certain human diseases, you would like also to test uh, treatment effects. And we have also done that in our EAE model. Uh, one therapeutic intervention that is a, a, a potential therapeutic approach for optic neuro, neuropathy is uh, the use of a neonatal FC receptor antibody. And we have used that antibody in our uh, augmented EAE model. As you can see here on the left graph, uh, the treatment with the antibodies uh, diminish the severity score of uh, the disease significantly over time. And that is not only true for the clinical score, but that is also seen when you measure the visual function with uh, the opto drum. So the visual acuity without the treatment decreases significantly in the AAE model, 
But when you treat the animal uh, at day 20, you don't see that a significant decrease of the visual acuity anymore. And by that, you have a mean to compare the treatment directly to the visual function. Uh, I would like to conclude my talk uh, with some pros and some cons of the uh, use of optomotor response as a functional measurement. Uh, the, the first pro I would like to mention is that you always can use freely moving animals. You don't need an anesthesia like in ERG, which helps you to uh, serve animals. Uh, the, the optomotor reflex measurement is fast and reliable. And uh, the automated uh, detection uh, saves you from an observer bias. On the other hand, and because of the automated detection, the values have quite high variability. So you have to have a certain number of animals. And uh, you cannot do any cell type specific measurement in the retina, which you, for instance, could do by using the actual electroretinogram. But uh, at the end, I would like to mention also that uh, there is a uh, Additionally to the optomotor response that looks for the head movement, there is also the so-called optokinetic reflex, which observes basically the eye movement. And under normal uh, conditions, the both are comparable. With that, I would like to acknowledge my group and uh, the colleagues from the Department of Neurology here in Bern and also the funding partners. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to welcome everyone back to the audio line and we'll jump straight into our Q&A session. So our first question um, of the, the, the day is um, for you, Volker. Is the optomotoric or optomotoric reaction comparable to the optokinetic reflex? Yes, under normal circumstances, they are comparable, as I just mentioned in my talk. So, but I would like to add uh, a quick explanation of that. So the optokinetic reflex or the OKR refers to compensatory eye movements, while the optomotor reflex or OMR refers to compensatory head movements. However, if the ocular muscles involved in the OKR are degenerated, the compensatory eye movement could, could be different from the head movement. Hmm. Okay. Um, Thomas, this next one is actually for you. Can all mouse lines be assessed with the optomotor measurements? Um, yes, in principle they can, uh, but there are some exceptions. Um, for example, the mouse line, DBA2J, that, that is a model to study glaucoma. Um, for that mouse line, some studies find that me these mice simply do not have an optomotor reflex, independent of their retinal phenotype. Um, but this finding is inconsistent between different labs, so there may well be subtypes of DBA2J mice with and without the ability to have an optomotor reflex. Um, I think this highlights the importance uh, to have a good control in each study that shows that your phenotypic observation, uh, for example, the lack of optomotor reflex, is really associated with the objective of your study. The other example are albino mice. Uh, here, the data is also inconsistent between studies. Some studies find that they do not have an optomotor reflex. Other studies find that they do have the reflex, but reversed. They reflexively move their heads in the wrong direction, opposite of the moving stripe pattern. This is due to a mistake in axonal crossing at the optic chiasm. Again, this shows the importance to have a proper control. So in the optodrum, you can measure the optomotor reflex of all mice. But as the examples I mentioned above show, uh, is that the absence of the motor reflex in a specific mouse line may reflect a biological deficit 
that may not be related to your primary research question. Okay. Um, Volga, we're going back to you for this one. What are the advantages, um, or sorry, what are the disadvantages of manual versus automo um, automatic OMR measurements? Okay, I just would like to mention two. The, the first one is um, when you do manually observation, the, the experimenters actually have to be trained quite extensively because it is not so easy to distinguish between the reflexes you would like to measure and compensatory movements of the whole animal. And second, an experienced observer has, as I said, experience. And that means uh, even when the experimenter is blinded, uh, he or she become biased during the measurements and somehow can already, by looking at the animals and their movement, can anticipate the expected outcome. Great. Um, so this is a bit of a situational question. So the, the person would like to know, or they've stated, in my studies, I only treat one eye and the other eye serves as a control. Thomas, can this be assessed with the optimal reflex? Uh, yes, this is possible. Um, maybe I give some background if you would if you would yeah. stimulate only the right eye with a moving stimulus, you would observe that the optomotor reflex is only triggered for a stimulus motion towards the left, but not triggered for stimulus motion toward the right. The same but opposite would happen if you only stimulate the left eye. Of course, in normal experiments, both eye of the animal see the stimulus at the same time. But still then the optomotor movement to the left is triggered because the stimulus is seen by the right eye and vice versa. Uh, the reason for this is that in rodents, the responsible brain circuits, circuits, which include the accessory optic system or AOS, uh, they are wired up in a monolateral fashion. So in the optodrum, you can independently analyze the reflex in the two directions. So, so yes, you can, uh, if you only treat one eye, and the other eye serves as control, uh, you can draw independent conclusions for each eye by analyzing the optomotor behavior separately, separately for stimulus motion in different directions. Great. Um, Kaushik, this one's for you. Uh, I have a question regarding the nuclear inversion project. If optics are better, why is the nuclear adaptation not found in diurnal mammals? That's a very interesting and intriguing question. Uh, as uh, one aspect of the uh, advantage that we see for nuclear inversion and the subsequent uh, improvement of vision, it is exclusive for nocturnal mammals and the small increases in contrast may not be relevant for diurnal animals where there is sufficient amount of light such that the uh, neural circuitry can compensate for any contrast loss. Uh, this is uh, definitely uh, been established in other studies that there are con contrast compensatory mechanisms uh, available. And secondly, uh, if such an adaptation has to exist for diurnal mammals, it might actually be counterproductive because uh, making a change in the way DNA is packed or DNA is organized has shown to have effects in terms of uh, repair mechanisms uh, uh, that exist in the cells. So broad photoreceptors uh, are prone to easy degeneration because of this uh, compacted uh, DNA structure. So these two reasons uh, could uh, contribute to the diurnal mammals not having such an adaptation. Okay. And on that, Thomas, can scotopic measurements be measured or sorry, be performed with the optodrum? Uh, yes, we, we do offer everything that is needed. 
uh, to do scotopic measurements uh, in the form of, uh, we call it a scotopic kit uh, that is available as an optional accessory item. Wonderful. Um, Volker, does the extent of retinal damage influence the measurement method of choice? Yes, it definitely does. So in general, you could, could say as larger the damage, as easier it is to measure the functional effects. And vice versa, a smaller focal damage, damage in the retina needs to be more quantified with more sensitive and especially locally circumscribed methods. Okay. Um, and actually, in the interest of time, we are going to make this, uh, this question our last question. Um, how do you make sure the animal stays on the platform? Thomas, maybe you can start and then I might ask for some, uh, some feedback also from um, Kashik and Volker. Um, well, interestingly enough, animals usually do stay on the platform, uh, but there are certain factors that support this. Uh, first, if an animal is well handled, uh, in general, well handled, it is much calmer and is way more likely not to be jumpy and, and thereby jumping off the platform. Um, secondly, it also helps that the optodrum opens at the front, not at the top. And placing an animal on the platform from the front uh, also reduces stress and the animal can get used uh, to the new environment more quickly. And the other thing that happens when uh, animals are being tested, different animals are being tested in the same arena. Uh, they're, of course, very sensitive to urine smell, etc., from previous animals that we're in. And the front door makes it so much easier to clean the arena, which helps to keep the animals calm. Okay. Volker, can you share any um, best practices from, from your work? Yeah, of course, I have uh, actually two personal tips. Uh, I mean, first of all, it helps to place the animal on the platform without showing a stimulus the day before, even if it is just for two minutes. And then secondly, in our experience, to do the measurements in the morning instead of the afternoon is also very helpful to uh, measure more, uh, to measure faster and more reliably. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much for the fantastic information, both in your presentations um, and during this Q&A session. And thank you so much to, your, to our audience for taking time out of your day to attend this webinar. We hope that you found the information presented both educational and applicable to your research. Of course, a very big thank you to our sponsor, Stratech and Stolting. In closing, thank you again for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar, and we look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone.